distance crew in that one. All kinds of track and field to get to. Won't cheat you in front of any of it. It'll all be here when we come back to Fayetteville, Arkansas, track capital of the world. And we are back on the first full day of competition here at the 2021 SEC Track and Field Championships indoor in Arkansas. Take a look at the women's team standings after three events and Ole Miss is on top courtesy of 22 points in the weight throw, which is what you'd expect from Connie Price Smith's team. We go right to the high jump. Dwight, uh, that's a miss. That's the one nice thing about this. The feedback is immediate. True, and the competition has just begun with the bar at 5'5 five, five and a quarter, 1 meter 66. 20 athletes in the competition as opposed to only 12 for the men. And we'll see some spillover of high jumpers, also long jumping later. Carly Hinkle of Kentucky, the next jumper. And that's a clearance for Carly. Runs the turn well. You know, you always want to have your inside shoulder there. And by that, we mean by inside, the one that should be inside the center of the circle. So an athlete who approaches from the right like Carly and like Dan and I did, we want our left shoulder in the circle as much as we can and with a lean with a full body, not uh, just your shoulder and your head, but your whole body. That's an early miss. It's difficult to know how much time it'll take for the bar to get up to the heights where they'll score, but those who are long jumping are hoping that happens quickly so that they can have a little rest or more warm up time for their long jump approaches. Helen Claire Edmonds of Mississippi State. And that's an easy clearance. Opening height, first few jumpers. Women tend to take less time than the men do. They're ready to go and they don't take much time th thinking about it. Nika Williams of Kentucky. And since I didn't see everybody warm up, I don't know what the distribution is of jumpers from one side or the other, but on the women's side of things internationally, it's pretty close to even, I'd say. Allison Tanner of Auburn. And over with a slight brush. I always try to tell my jumpers to aim their flight to the back corner of the pit. For right side jumpers, if you're any more left than that, you're traveling down the bar, exposing your bar, body to the bar for too long a period of time and usually take a lot of heights off from the knee down that way. Jada Sims of Vanderbilt. Also over with a slight brush. You can see a little support there on the jumping knee. Long legs. That's certainly not an impediment in this event. The higher center of gravity starts on your body, the easier it is to raise it. Allison Andrus, her first attempt. They look like they're going straight through here, Dwight. You know, usually with this many competitors, they do a five alive type, but this is a championship meet. But 20 jumpers in a competition like this uh, uh, could take a while. Why don't you explain to the folks what a five alive is versus a, a straight through format? I'll tell you, I, I really hate being a judge for a five alive because I always forget to pick that person up that had the miss. <laughs> But it, it really is an advantage for the jumpers, in, in my opinion, and that is that they don't have to wait for 19 jumpers to go by to take their second attempt. Maybe they made a very easily fixable mistake, and they'd like to get right back out there and fix it. So that way, you're never more than five more, four, four more athletes away from jumping again. And they usually do that till they get down to a more manageable number, usually eight or less, and then they'll go straight through. Um, the order, but yeah, it's torture when you've, you've had an early miss and you've got to wait for a dozen or 15 or so high jumpers to go um, before you can take your second attempt. You start to overanalyze things or maybe you forget about what it is that you did, not sure quite how to fix it. 
but you're right. It does appear that they're going straight through. But the one th great thing that's great about women in field events, they just do not take any time at all standing there um, thinking about it. Well, especially at these especially at these low heights. This is Shayla Broughton from Mississippi State. What's interesting, though, is this is the transition that you, some of these athletes need to understand when they have these when they have competitions on the weekends on a Saturday versus a championship meet, be ready for some of those long delays. Be ready for the amount of time it takes you to check in and get your spikes checked and then get walked over to the, uh, get you know, get over to the table and then they seat you. So by the time you get done warming up in the warm-up area, you could come out to the out to the jumping area, out to the running area and have not done anything for sometimes up to 20 or 30 minutes. How do you make those adjustments and still run a good race and still jump well? Yeah, I'd like to see our athletes better prepared for that at the international level, those who get there by having the high school and collegiate level do something that more mirrors that. I remember my mind was blown um, at the Olympics when I was 18 because they basically took me out of my warm-up to take me to the call room and everybody's in a very small space. You can't do your normal warm-up. It's much better for you to know that that's coming and, and be able to have a, an alternative warm-up regime ready for it. And when you get to those scoring heights, Dwight, right, it, it's a little like golf. You always assume that guy's going to make that putt, right? You always, right. Assume that, uh, you always assume a make from that competitor. I mean, it goes without saying you, all, you want to clear heights on a first attempt. It just goes without saying. But not only is it strategically important, but it's also for your own confidence as the bar gets into the heights where you're going to score or maybe you're going to medal. You just can't afford to have hiccups early on because now you're pressing and you're hoping for an opening or a mistake made by one of your competitors. And you can't control your competitors. I'm still trying to get a scene of what that would look like if you didn't get to stay into your routine, Dwight. How, how upsetting was oh, that for you? You know how, how <laughs> OCD I am. Yeah, that was a good way to get me off my game. But I learned early, thankfully. And I was usually ready for something like that to happen. So here's a, a, here's a great example of an athlete where this surface is really faster than she was expecting, and she needs to move back because she didn't have enough room to run her run. So she compensated and figured it out. You can see Petro Cipriano right there holding the, uh, the big uh, iPad. Um, he probably is telling her exactly that, showing her the arc of the last four steps of her approach. She went really wide and came down the bar. Didn't have a miss, but you want to be honest and evaluate your own performance if it was not a good technical jump even if it's a make it's not a great jump and you know, coaches coach for good jumps not for clearances clearances come with good jumps there's lots of great jumps technically that end up being misses just because you jump from the wrong spot and there's lots of really rotten jumps that are makes <laughs> what's interesting about that is she can come over and she can look at the jump on that ipad and for a long time, when that technology was available, athletes weren't allowed to do that in the championship settings. But um, here at the SECs, they are. I'm not sure if they can at the NCAA meet. Yeah, maybe not. It's a great tool. And I mean, think about, John, you and I in high school, the coach would take the eight millimeter film of the, of the <laughs> yeah, practice, yes. and you come back the next week to look at what you did last week, and you have no relativity to it as a 15 or 16 year old kid. So the instant feedback and the instant gratification and, and the video knowledge. You, the coach no longer has to be listened to necessarily of what he thinks you just did or telling you what you did. You can see it. And if you understand the event and understand the physics of the event, he can show you, look, look at what happened here. When you did this, then these three things happen. So fix this one thing and these other three things will fix themselves. Well, and that's a relatively new thing, Dan. I was at some high school meets not more than two or three years ago where I had taken some iPhone video of one of the youngsters I was working with and an opposing coach said, hey, listen, just so you know, you're new, first time, can't do that. And then the, the rule had changed by the next year. So that's changing all the time in some places where it's allowed and where it's not. I think it's dumb to not let it be allowed. You have it there and you can help the kids and, and it should be by all means used. All right, we're on a little bit of delay here. Oh, they're going to pull the cone, so we're going to stick with it. Yeah, I think in the er especially in the high school or even age group um, setting, it's all about the kids learning the technique and learning how to compete and learning how to fix mistakes. Um, I think it's a penalizing them if the technology exists to not allow them uh, access to it or to allow their coaches to help them with it. I still think it's interesting, you know, in the sport of track and field, we get we can communicate with our coaches instantly. I got a chance to train a, a couple of young budding 
tennis players, even at the youngest levels, you're not allowed to get any coaching or any advice from your coach or any of the other spectators in a tennis match. Even that's from that's from little little kids all the way through professionals. You're not allowed to accept any kind of advice. You're out there. You play the game on your own. Interesting. Glad I'm not a tennis player. <laughs> well, even when those rules were in in place for track and field athletes, and it wasn't seemingly that long ago, the athletes always and coaches always figured out a way to communicate. Coaches sat where they weren't supposed to. They had the sign language. All kinds of other things were going on where they got plenty of coaching. Okay, guys, I, th I think this delay here is, and I got a chance to see Anna Hall having a lot of discussions with uh, with the officials. Tyra Gittens as well. There's a number. There's a there's a few heptathletes here in the high jump area that are going to go over and long jump, and I think they're getting instructions on what happens when that event starts. Am I going to be able to leave this event and go over there? Am I, you know, because in a championship setting, if you miss a jump it's considered a pass and you don't get to you don't get to come back and take it on a saturday afternoon here in arkansas if i missed all my long jumps and i was high jumping i could come over and take three in a row and i get that mark in but not a championship setting and in the high jumping you're never allowed to lower the bar back down for anybody if you miss the first jump at the height you you pass the height all right they're ready to go again camilla dendy of auburn up for her first attempt at the opening height five five and a quarter All right, so that was a series of straight lines at the end as opposed to a curve. So it'd be nice to sand off the angles of those straight lines. You know, there are no cuts in, in track and field, but she just she just made one anyway. <laughs> and once you leave the ground, everything you've done on the ground kind of shows in the air. If you're going over the bar sideways, a little bit crooked, that's because of your foot placement and your takeoff angle. So you can see her trajectory is going right out the left side of the pit. And that means her run was way too deep. Needs to approach much more directly to the bar. That's the way you use the minimum amount of bar possible. So we're now on second attempts. High jump, one of the easier events to socially distance. Yeah, just way too much horizontal. You know, high jump is just not about speed until the bar is well over your head. It's about position, and it's about execution of the technique that's going to get you into the air. So 20 competitors start. There were 10 makes on the opening bar, five misses, and five people have opted to pass. Two of those individuals, Tyra Gittens and Anna Hall. So Allie is the first or only high jumper I've seen today with a run-in approach in that she, she hits a mark after a few jogging steps. And I finally evolved to that kind of a run late in my career, which is why I had some late success in my career as opposed to having a stationary longer run up, which oftentimes ended up in lane one or lane two of the track, which, which was never fun when there were distance runners going by. By the way, I love how you casually say late success, because like the American record is very good late success. <laughs> like yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I don't know if that would have happened if, if I had made that adjustment in my run up, which was, uh -huh. was tough to do that late. You know, 29, 30 years old, things are pretty well set. But that goes to show how difficult the event is, how complex it is, and how tough it is to, you know, how many, how long it takes to learn the event. I wasn't a really good high jumper either until I was 27, 28 years old. I had the hops when I was 18, 19. Boy, I could jump out of the gym, but certainly couldn't high jump as high. Well, it's such an important position event. And, and that's the why I like Kyra Gittens, the way she keeps things compact and she can have a very narrow parabolic curve because she brings everything up into the air. When you're taller, you can, you can be a little sloppy, but the problem with that is, is that everybody in the event at the highest level, they're pretty tall. I mean, there's, there are exceptions. But for the most part, the high jumpers are, are tall guys and, and tall women. 
I mean, Blanka Vlasic was as tall as I was. Just retired, I heard. Yeah. Right, a couple days ago, yeah. officially. Yeah, this last week or two. All right, third and final attempts. By the way, the other great myth in high jumping we should we should tell people is that just because you make it and you scurry off the mat and then it falls, it's you still missed. Yeah, that was uh, <laughs> no longer a rule before I was in high school. <laughs> right, but you still see kids. I do. It's great to watch them just, you know, crab off that thing as quick as they can. I know. I, I, <laughs> I can't. I just shake my head when I see that because they didn't. They didn't. That's not one of their chromosomes. Someone told them that. Right, right. That's not uh, innate. I'm sure I heard that somewhere as well, but it is a reasonable amount of time, and it's, right. it's, it's, it's judged by the official. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it's, it is somewhat subjective, and when the wind is blowing, that subjectivity, I have questioned that subjectivity <laughs> a few times. And, and they might even put their reverse tape on their bars over at SC, right? Uh, yeah, sure, or, <laughs> or elsewhere. <laughs> well, at least we don't have the wind issue when you're indoors. But That's true. That's why I loved indoors. Controlled conditions, no wind, no rain. Right. Pretty so, bouncy surfaces normally. Until they put the mat too far over and you are got your right shoulder against a wall. Yeah. <laughs> you're trying to move things out. But, or, but tell that to a pole vaulter. There, even if you're indoors, a pole vaulter would say, I had a headwind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Anything other than tailwind is a headwind yeah. to them. Mm -hmm. Allison, for a lot of uh, the young ladies jump, jumping here, Allison, the, you know, she's opening at her PR. That's always sort of difficult. Josephine Dahl, who we missed, she was going a center meter over her PR. And that will conclude the jumping at the opening height, five, five and a quarter. They will move the bar up. We will step aside for a moment and be back with more high jump after this. And we are back here at the SEC Indoor Track and Field Championship. The only event going on right now is the high jump, which is great because it should be featured, quite frankly. It's the right event to be all on its own right here. We're on to the second height in the competition at five, seven and a quarter. Miss there from Mississippi State's Helen Claire Edmonds. PR of 172 as they jump metrically at 171. And it's always tough for athletes who are jumping at heights that they're sort of at their max early in the competition. They, they have ideas that they can jump well enough at the championship meet to maybe score points. It's where you want to bring your best mark of the year, obviously. It's a championship. And I try to tell the kids I work with, I said, you know, work on, on starting higher just from a psychological standpoint. You know, you might have a, I had a kid that had a 6'8 PR boy, but he liked to start at 5'10. And I told him, I said, you know, the state meet qualifying starts at 6'3. And I know you can make it, but if that has to be your opening height and you haven't started high before, it's a mind blower. Being at the state meet's a mind blower. Just, you need to eliminate those problems. Everybody likes to start low and have successes, but uh, sometimes those decisions are out of your hand. In fact, all the time those decisions are out of your hand. And frankly, you know, when you get into the elitist area, which of course we tend to be, you know, it's a championship. So the bar starting low or a standard being too soft is really not helping anybody. So she definitely has the height, just needs to get it in the right place. And that's the difficulty with the high jump. It's not a runway. It's not a circle. It's an open space and you get, it's an open canvas and you get to paint on it. And you have to have enough repetitions of, a, of an approach that you feel comfortable with that you can absolutely duplicate perfectly when it comes to the most important event. And when you're a little bit juiced up and you're excited and you feel good, you need to know your body well enough to know what adjustments you need to make to put that plant foot where it needs to be so your hips can be right over the crossbar. 
you can get away with being a little off at the at the lower heights but when it gets close to your season best your lifetime best whatever it might be you want to make certain that your hips are directly over the crossbar give yourself the maximum opportunity to clear the bar so Anna Hall coming in a little earlier than I would expect. She did jump six two and a quarter yesterday in the pentathlon competition. But very busy. Heptathlon yesterday, high jump and long jump today. So she's over easily, a little closer to the bar probably than would be ideal. I would suggest she move back a bit. So Dan, you know, those arms are not really doing her a lot of good at the plant. She just kind of throws them up in the air. She doesn't really block with them or anything. It, it makes her longer and it helps extend her center of gravity, but she's not really converting or or getting really a lot of benefit from them. Well, two hip two heptathletes or two pentathletes who competed yesterday in a row there, Anna Hall over Shayla. Shayla Broughton from Mississippi State. She jumped 171. She made five, seven and a quarter, so she this is, a, this is a bar that she made yesterday, but one of the things that Petros told me at Georgia, they were trying to move Anna's step back. They were trying to, because she needs that space. You yep. just, you, you, you're going to get to a point where you need to move your step back or you're not going to be able to jump any higher. And, and they were working on being a little bit more compact with those arms. Yeah, the arms are so critical in the event, especially those last few steps to gather everything. Because what you want is your knee to go up as high as you possibly can get it, hold it there for a split second, and the way to hold it there is to have your arms up helping you hold it there. That's Rachel Glenn's opening height e over easily. So as much as you know, people think you jump and you got to go with your legs. Away, I am obsessed with arms, both the way you carry them. Some people, you know, whether they flag that one arm there. Uh, ideally, like I always thought, you block them with your eyes and then just try to lay them back, kind of down, almost on your thighs, and, and quiet arms, um, and just how much they can help drive that knee. Yeah, I, I prefer to, to tell the kids that you pull your knee up with your arms. And, and create that illusion of like your arms with a you know, with a, a cable underneath your knee, and that your arms are what control how long the knee, how high it goes up, and how long it stays there. You know, the world record holder on the men's side, Javier Sotomayor, aside from all his natural gifts with incredible tendon strength and everything else, he kept his knee up there. It seemed like an eternity, and it's only because he had strong flexor muscles and he he was very efficient with his arms. Good clearance there. Yeah, and I had a coach one time put me on a scale, and he said, if you think your arms aren't important, stand on the scale and you weigh whatever. At that point, I was 140 pounds, and then drive your arms up, and you go, oh, look, you, you know, now the scale goes to 300 pounds. Yeah. One of, the, one of the drills that we did that was really interesting is we jumped off that small springboard that the gymnasts use on the uh, when they when they do their tumbling pass on the, on the horse. Oh. And what that causes you to do is, you know, if you drop your knee, or you rush the jump, you're all over the place. So it, you, you have to, you, it's timing. It just changes the timing of your jump. It's fun because you're jumping much, much higher. Sure. But, but it's also uh, it's also a, an opportunity to be more in sync with the timing of your limbs. Bar is at five, seven and a quarter. And we've seen a couple of athletes that had passed the opening height and have come in here. That's the, the cut. And also you see she's under rotated because the, by not having any curve in the last three or four steps, she creates no opportunity to rotate. So the knee doesn't come across the body like it would normally on a curve. And she is under rotated. Head needs to be, head needs to be leading more than that. So the drill and the fix is a lot of, a lot of pattern, a lot of pattern. Running. Yeah, yep. a, lot of cur a lot of curve running. Circle, circle runs are yep. great. You know, learning how to get that shoulder in, in, into the inside of the circle, to the center of the circle, and feeling comfortable with being in that position, and then running it on the approach so you can see how differently the bar and the standards and the pit look because they're on an angle, and you've got to get used to what that angle looks like. 
It's funny though, right? Once you get that feel, like you just find yourself doing it all the time. Like you, you know, you're you're walking out of a room and <laughs> you cut through it. Like it's like people that long jump and always are working on hitting the board, right? You can't walk out a door without seeing the 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 where the door and With the, the threshold room separates, is. right? And you yeah. hit it, yeah. right? You same kind of thing. You find yourself always doing that lean or making those three or four steps, uh, just because you just work on it so much, and you get so used to what that feel is. Coach Lonnie Green giving a little instruction to Anika Williams. She jumped five, nine and three quarters in the pentathlon yesterday. She's one step closer to that next bar. Layout, you better be time that just right on top of the bar. In 1984 Olympic champion Dietmar Bogenberg, who was six foot seven, 171 pounds and could run about 10, six long jump, almost 25 feet. He said, you know, this position thing, it's just too hard to get enough times. It's not worth the investment that you're only going to get a 3% return. So I'm just going to run faster than everyone else <laughs> and take off further away. And I'm 6'7", and I'm going to take all that time to gain altitude, and then I'm going to do a quick push my hips to the sky. Right at the moment my hips are about to hit the bar, I'm going to, I'm just going to push them to the sky, and then of course they're going to be unpushed to the sky. But by then, because I've run so fast to the bar, my bottom will be past the bar. And he made a career out of it. <laughs> he jumped seven ten indoors for a world indoor record. He jumped seven eight and a half at the Olympics in 1984 to win the gold medal, and he had an incredibly successful and lengthy career. And that's what his whole philosophy of high jump was. And I would never teach it to a kid, even if it was built the way he was and had those gifts, but he made it work. So this is a high jumper who is not even trying to get on the balls of her feet in her run. She's running like a distance runner, which maybe she is. And her, she's lowering her center of gravity on the way. See how she stepped out with her right and then stepped the other way with her left? But she's already not on the balls of her feet. So even though she's, and she's clearly not the tallest athlete out there, so she's giving away a ton of inches in, in center of gravity by not running on the balls of her feet and not executing with her feet properly at the end. She's got decent mechanics, but She's running almost flat-footed on the way to the bar. It's hard to compete with an athlete who looks like this when you run like that. To be a good high jumper, you need to do a lot of track running, 150 meters and down, and become really a, a decent technical runner. That was good. That was nice. Run tall, good posture. Yep. Stay tall. Good clearance. When you see a clearance like that, it's like, okay, she's got another bar. Oh, this, yeah. This was, this was, that Definitely. was the same bar she made in the pentathlon. And that was the best technical jump so far for her as well. Nice, nice timing since it was her third attempt. Keeps her in the competition. And that's really the only thing you can do when you have all those misses. When you finally have a good, yeah, you can see, <laughs> duh, what have I been doing? And then, then they're like, okay, now jump like that. Make it feel like that. And sometimes, you know, you can maybe sneak up a little further than you might have expected, even with those misses, because now it's like, okay, I just woke up and now I know what I'm doing and now I know how to high jump again. All right, we're done at five, seven and a quarter. The bar will go up with fewer jumpers and we'll be back with more. Carly Hinkle just missing first jumper, her first attempt at 176, five, nine and a quarter. As we continue our coverage of the high jump here at the SEC Indoor Championship. Here you go, Dwight. Here's, what, here's a gal that can do it. Yeah, I, I like her technique. I like the way she runs. She stays compact. She's got her front side running mechanics. Field of 20 has been paired to 12. She does that walk in. Just an eight step approach. It's more than enough and she's too close. She needs to move back. She barely missed that with her Achilles tendon on the way on the way over. Correction, we're down to 14 athletes because we've got people who have passed who are just now coming in.
She jumped six two and a quarter yesterday during the pentathlon competition. On the women's side, the SEC has the top three jumpers in the country, all in the same conference. So these, many of these same, same ladies will be back here in two weeks battling it out for the national title. So Allison Tanner of Auburn. She made the previous height on her third attempt. That takes us to Jada Sims, who matched her personal best by clearing the last bar. So this would be a jump at a lifetime best, two inches higher than she just cleared. That's actually a decent attempt. Oftentimes when you're going at an all-time best, you hit it with your head on the first one. You <laughs> learn nothing. Chastise yourself for being a knucklehead. So she does a nice job with her arms, timing it with a block. She's just too deep on her run up and, and jumping down the bar. Safari, Sakari famous. And by clearing the last bar, that was a season best. She definitely has the pop to make this height. Yeah. No question. I'll tell you, a field of 20 men would very easily take two and a half or three hours back in the day. Field of 20 women, they'll probably have this banged out in about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. Okay, Anna Hall, who jumped six, two and a quarter yesterday as well during the pentathlon. It was a lifetime best. Cleared five seven and a quarter on her first attempt. Now the bar at five nine and a quarter. And now she fixed her run up, and her height was right over the crossbar on that one. Nice adjustment. Well, and what you'll see with Anna Hall is the same jump over and over and over again. And if you were to put a highlight where her takeoff step, it wouldn't vary that much from as the competition goes off, uh, goes on. She is so consistent at just what she does very, very well. And what's, what she does great is she jumps high, but what's gonna hurt her in the long run is, can she break out of that pattern? Can she scoot that step out a little bit, give herself a little bit more time to jump a little bit higher? Because she definitely could be a 195, a, you know, a 195, 197. And you know, when you get to the highest levels of the heptathlon internationally, you need to jump, you know, you need to jump at least what she jumped here and the, was, the, was the 192. So, um, you know, she is a model of uh, some really good success, but also, you know, how do you, how do you break that uh, conditioning? Well, I think she it needs a lot of arm work. She's, I don't think she's getting much of any benefit from her arms at takeoff. And that's hard to learn. I mean, not only just, just to learn the movements, but to, to time it. I'm, and let's face it, her, her plate is full with, with yeah. multi. I'm always impressed with people that have a strange injury and they have to switch sides and they jump with the other leg in the long jump or the high jump and you're just, I'm, I'm amazed at how they can do that because I'm not sure I would have been able to, able to do that. I switched my feet in the hurdles because I wanted to go seven to the first hurdle, but whew, major, major changes are, are tough in the sport. Yeah. I couldn't clear my throat off my right foot, so <laughs> that would not have been an option. <laughs> Well, th that's a height that she made because she's tall. Um, she went right into the bar off the ground, and you can you can get away with that based on how tall you are. So I tell a lot of my kids that here are your choices. You can grow taller, or you can learn to jump correctly. And I'm, I'm, I'm betting on the growing <laughs> taller probably being off the table. Well, and then, you know, so often sometimes you're tall, but like you said, you, you lean or you slump and you're like, that's an asset. Stand tall. Don't give it away. I tell kids that all the time. I said, your parents gave you a gift. Don't squander it. 
All right, here's the third best in the conference, therefore third best in the country, Abigail O'Donohue. Is this her opener? Opening height, five, nine and a quarter. She's the last one to come into the competition. And over easily. I'm not, I'm not crazy about that run up. It looked a little segmented to me, but that might just be because it was the first attempt, first jump of the competition. Drops that knee really quick there. Yeah. But I like her angle of attack. And it's the it's the left the left side jumpers that tend to jump down the bar more than right side jumpers. I don't know why that is, but I made a study of it, and it, it, it absolutely is a fact. So they need to work harder at approaching more directly. More Georgia high jumpers. I mean, there's a talent pipeline there when you go back, whether it's somebody like Kendall Williams, who is also a, a you know, a world-class heptathlete, but Maddie Fagan and Tatiana Goosen, and, and they roll through national champs in, in this event. Yeah, they seem to have a little bit of a, a dearth on the guy's side right now, but I don't think that that'll last too long. Those are some long legs right there. That's a high center of gravity. Just from my vantage point, I, I'm betting that that young lady is probably my height. She's 6'4", and it seems to be mostly legs. That's a great gift. All right. We go to second round jumps at five, nine and a quarter. Back to Carly Hinkle. She had a very nice attempt on the first one, just not in the right spot. Let's see if she makes the proper adjustment. Now she needs to be a little closer. First jump is better, higher in the air. Almost the same as the first time around. Plenty yeah. of height. Yeah. I and mean, she's right. She knows she has it. It's so frustrating when you've gotten the hardest parts of the body past the crossbar and you knock it off on the way down. It's just timing. You know what these kids today don't have to deal with that people my age or your age, Dwight, had to do is they always go, oh, are you, were you a flopper? <laughs> right? <laughs> right. If you were of a certain age, they'd be like, okay, I know how old you think I am. Yeah. Because you asked me that question. And I am, but that still doesn't mean I can't be mad that you asked me that question. Yeah. Well, you know, over 50, 50 years ago, 53 years ago, Dick won the gold medal with that technique, and it didn't catch on right away. And a lot of the wrong built people tried to do it. And there was a movement of coaches that really tried to get rid of it. Yeah, if it had been, if the long, the somersault long jump had come second, I think the flop could have been banned and we might be somersault long jump now. <laughs> well, let's face it, we all know you, you couldn't have had the Fosbury flop without foam rubber landing pits. There were some pretty rudimentary versions of that back in the day, but it sure beat sawdust all day long. Now these pits are huge. I mean, my high school pole vault pit was smaller <laughs> than the high jump pits today. I feel fortunate I got a chance to compete with one of the last straddlers that I can remember in Christian Shank. Christian Shank, who was a great yeah. technician. Oh, he was a beautiful technician. Is it a 228 guy, maybe? Yeah, yeah. 27 or 28. He, um, I always said, if I could jump as high with the straddle as I could with the flop, 
and I could train the same way. I would prefer to straddle because hmm. it's such a beautiful, complicated technique. But it just, it's just not efficient. See, and I ran with one of the last of the great rollers in Ben Lucero. Yeah. Benjamin uh, Franklin Lucero, Las Cruces, New Mexico. He yep. went to the trials in 84. I think he was there with you. But yeah, Lucero. Uh, let's see, who was the other one? Uh, uh, Canadal. Bill Canadal was a, a, a straddler. Mark Branch was a good straddler. Um, Randy Smith from Kansas. That's all sort of mid-70s as we were starting to switch the indoor setup to accommodate the flop. And boy, they, they did not take it well. They, <laughs> they, they, they did not, they didn't take it gracefully. Good guys, though. It's just an end of an era. And, and frankly, most of them were not really built properly to do the flop effectively anyway. I did some pandemic basement cleaning like everybody else and looking for chores, and I found some old pictures of Ben, and I showed them to my son. I said, what do you think he's doing here? And he's like, I have no idea. <laughs> Right. You got a great picture of Jim Thorpe. I don't, what was that style? Ben, they used to pull the knees yeah, up. Eastern cutoff or some yeah. other yeah. nonsense. Yeah. But again, they were you know basically jumping into nothing. Sand. Well, that was that was certainly her best of the three. Yeah, I mean Ben Lucero jumped what seven four and change seven five. Yeah, yeah. And and not a tall guy. No. And and. Not the regular, you talk about the angle of attack, right? He, instead of that 45 degree angle that you saw most of those guys do, he had sort of a screwy J type yeah. run up. I mean, yeah. he was really a He's unicorn almost, kind of a guy. Almost more of a, a dive straddler type guy, but good pop. Right. Bar stayed up. That's all I remember. That's right. That's all that matters. So, third and final attempt for Carolyn Lawrence. This has been sort of a watershed height. We. Oh, excuse me, second attempt. Thank you. This is a quintessential high jump build right here. Very long legs, thin. Oh, yeah. Got the levers for it, definitely. It's really the timing of, of the last two foot contacts just isn't, isn't there today. Well, Lena, look how far deep down that right side of the pit she lands. Wow, well, See, almost, almost, almost the to the other stand. standard. Yeah. yeah, that just can't happen. That's just, you're just asking for it. You, you expose those limbs to the bar long enough and the bar wins. <laughs> All right, now we're at third attempts. The bar Harley always Hinkle. wins. True. <laughs> Newton always wins. <laughs> okay, this is a bar she can make, no question about that. Maybe not today, but it's definitely a bar she can make. Don't want to get away from this competition, but I love the conversation that we were having. Did you ever see the Valerie Brumel touch the toe on the basketball yeah, rim? Yeah, I've got that. I've got that. Um, that still. And uh, <laughs> I, I was lucky enough to talk to him a couple of times, and he pretty much verified all of the things that I had heard about him about the weights that he li that he could lift, and it's a heck of a weightlifter for his size. And uh, he was. I remember him telling me, you know, I said, so who do you think cool. is the greatest ever? This is 1987. Look at that, stays on. Finally got it. We love it. <laughs> we always take the clearances, no matter what, because we're, we're cheated out of plenty of them. Right, it's like golf, right? I've, I've never gotten a single good break in golf, but I've got all the bad ones. Same thing. Yep. Bar never stays up. Anyway, I said, so who do you think was the greatest ever? He says, I don't know, uh, Stones, three world records, uh, Nietzsche, um, uh, the Chinese guy, three world records, Brumel, six world records. I think Brumel. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Very straightforward. Okay. Can't argue with that. Used to be a great picture of him when you walked in Madison Square Garden of him. Yeah. The big bright red jersey and the white shorts and going over like that. Now I think it's Spike Lee and Julius Randle. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of whom, by the way, were very good high jumpers. All right, well, she comes away for the day with a tie of her lifetime best. Can't complain about that in a championship competition.
Well, Sakari definitely has shown she's got the hop, she's got the energy. Just get her hips in the right spot, she'll be over this. I like her acceleration. Yeah, it's frustrating knowing that you can make a bar. You've been close twice. Now this is it. You want, you're just trying to purchase three more jumps. That's all you're here to do right now. Oh, boy. That's so frustrating. And especially now, too, when you said you have the immediate video feedback to go look at that and go, oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, no. oh, it's just as good as I thought it was, but the yeah. bar's not on. <laughs> yeah, had it in my lap. So we have seven clearances so far, so we've cut the field in half if nobody else makes it from the last height. And we come back with more of the SEC Championships. Back at the SEC Championships moments ago. Tyra Gittens and Dwight, when it's done well, it is elegant. Yeah, and it, she just makes it look so easy. I mean, the height right over the top of the crossbar, very little effort. I love the walk-in eight-step. I'm wondering if that uh, kinesio tape is preventative or, or what's going on. Warming up on the pole vault, and also the women's long jump will be happening shortly. Here is Anna Hall. First attempt at 5, 10, and 3 quarters. Now watch what she does with her arms at the end. There really is just no pull with the arm. She just throws them over her head, which makes her upper body longer and allows her more control over her layout. But she's not getting any benefit of transfer of energy and no help keeping her knee up. So that would be the one improvement I would definitely be working on. She's already jumping 6'2 and a quarter with doing those things. That's going to add two or three inches right there. Yeah, she could bring those hands, these arms at least waist high and, and then bring them up and they'd be helping her all that much. But I, but I have to correct, I kept, I said she made 192 in the pentathlon. Everybody's going to murder me if I don't get this right. She made 189, yeah. six, two and a quarter. Yeah. Have the O'Donnell Hugh up next. She came in at the last height, five, nine and a quarter. Everyone else was in the competition before that. Let's see if she puts some curve in that last part of her run up. She ran kind of straight the last four on her first attempt. And that was better, but still see how by going deep like that, she's jumping down the bar. Left sided jumper jumping down the bar. It, it's pretty, pretty normal. But an easy clearance by O'Donohue. She got the serious look on her face. You know what that? You know what that look is? I'm not gonna get beat by a multi-eventer today. <laughs> <laughs> well, the multi-eventers jumped higher than the women's high jump winner in Rio. So the regular high jumpers kind of need to get over it. love for someone to tell me how tall she actually is. It's really hard for me to be certain. So far, she's clean. Oh, that's not true. She was second attempt on the last, second attempt clearance on last time. But a first attempt here. We're already in point scoring territory. Dwight, she is 5'11 and a half. Oh, she looks so much taller than that. 5'11 and a half. Wow. I thought she was at least 6'3, so it's hard to tell from up here. This is a 
the bar she should make. It's one of those who didn't quite fast enough through that curve, kind of stalled out over the bar and came down. Second attempts here at one meter 80, five, 10, and three quarters. So Rachel Glenn, she jumped into the pit on her first one. Let's see if she jumps into the air on this one. There you go, that's better. But she also makes a cut to get into her turn. And that's very confusing to the center of gravity. She has all that velocity going forward for about four steps, and then she makes a cut with her outside foot. And not a lot of curve at the end of the run. Yeah, her jump and her run, her, her approach and her jump look a little bit segmented, but she seems to get into the right position over the bar, and that's a, that should, that'll, that'll tie a personal best there for her. First attempt miss for second attempt miss for Shelby Tyler. So the LSU website says she's six one, but that's still shorter than she appears to be. Maybe it's what she's wearing that makes her look even taller. So I went to the the <laughs> TFRSS site. They had her five eleven and a half. You just said six one. Todd Lane, her coach, this is gonna make you feel great. Just said she is six three maybe. Thank you. So. Apparently you eyed it up pretty good. That's from Todd Lane. Her coach will take that as the final answer. I like that. I like that answer. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that makes me right, I right. like. Yeah. Oh, she so has this, and she knows it. Very good with the feet at the end. As a coach, you just want to get out there and, 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 and help do it, do it for them. I know what it feels like. I know what it should be. How can I transfer that to you? Third attempts now. Shelby Tyler, Georgia. Lost two at that bar. Yeah, five, five remaining. Go over to the pole vault. Mackenzie Hayward, one of the stable of vaulters. Arkansas always seems to have a handful of pole vaulters. Up over that one. Yeah, thanks to the Weeks twins and Sute and many others in Tandy the last Morris. decade. Tandy Morris, of course, Arkansas by many vaulters, the place to go. All right, now the bar been raised to six feet, one meter 83. And Tyra Kittens up first in the order. So far, no misses in the competition. And she's made it with ease, plenty of room to spare. We'll keep an eye on her after this jump. The women's long jump is Scheduled to get started here very shortly, and she's in the competition. That's she's in the she's in the flight that the competition is going to be coming up here. So, boom! Quick change of shoes. Yeah, so she needs to move back. She's getting her height a little bit late on that one, and just misses taking it off with her lower legs. But that's a great example of. What do you do with your arms? That. That's what you Boom, do. Boom, right, right there. Right. When you already have hop, you're already on the balls of your feet, and you use your arms efficiently to transfer force, that's why she's as good a jumper as she is and, and, and could be better. Anna Hall, also with no misses in the competition. And that 
was a good jump of the hips and almost took it off of the calf. He's jumping at 183, which is six feet even. And we discussed this a little, right? Metrically, it's sort of an anomaly. There is no seven foot metric equivalent. Right. Six, eleven, three quarters, or seven feet a quarter, nothing in between. And Anna Hall sort of landed on her plant on that one. She was very fortunate that she was in good position. So now jumping at a lifetime best, Rachel Glenn. Now she's going to have to start jumping into the air. She should not be landing that deep in the pit. Abby O'Donoghue, also with no misses in the competition so far. Only two competitive jumps so far. There's no attempts ruled anymore, but if there was, she'd be in the lead. Might have been the most impressive one we've seen yet. Yeah. Well, she's got a great power to rate, weight ratio. She's tall and she's very thin. And that's a big advantage in the high jump. If you've got the strength to go along with it, it's a killer combination. Last thing you want to do is be paint, is being trying to carry you know more weight than you should, because then you just have to get so crazy strong in the weight room. And that leads to injuries. So a first miss for Bayak. I don't know if you guys knew this. She's 6'3". Is that right? Yes. 6'3". Yeah. She, she looks that tall. <laughs> now second attempts at six feet. Three clearances so far. Oh, my. That was almost a clearance. She had the hip height, but she just came out of her layout too soon. And her layout's very really flat anyway. That close to a lifetime best. Having already matched her lifetime best with the clearance at the last height. Back to the Aqua Bayak. Right into it. So she'll have one more. So Bayak is currently standing fourth. Rachel Glenn currently fifth. She basically had a clearance on the last height. Just came out of her layout at the wrong time. Let's see if she can make that adjustment. Oh, oh, even closer. All right, so she's a six foot plus high jumper right now. And that's what she should take away from this. Is that she can definitely get over that barrier. Look at the hips on that. She's six one and change, six two in the air. Curtis Fry's assistant coach D right now telling her, you, next time out, we're going to make that. She's already coaching for the next competition. So she will finish fifth. Bayak currently in fourth, would remain in fourth even with a clearance here. There you see bottom of the screen, Tyra Gittins. Doesn't look like she's making any attempt to get over the long jump. It's one flight of 16 jumpers. I think she wants to stay here, get the 10 points for the Aggies in the high jump. That was a certainly a much better jump than the last one, but she is out. Three remain. The bar will go up to six, one and a quarter when we return.
back in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Anna Hall of Georgia for her first attempt at six, one and a quarter. Currently tied for first in the competition. Winner of the hep of the pentathlon yesterday for Georgia. And that's a first miss of the competition for Anna Hall. She will have two more. But just moments ago, the first athlete up in the order, Tyra Gittens, who has a personal best of 6'3 and a quarter, remains clean with a little brush on the way down. First attempt at clearance at 6'1 and a quarter, so she is now in the lead in the event. Only three jumpers currently competing. Next up, Abby O'Donoghue. She has no misses in the competition so far. And she's in the catbird seat, jumping last in the order. And a miss for O'Donoghue. So opening the door nicely for Tyra Gittens. Both Hall and O'Donoghue will now have to jump at least the next height in order to take the lead. And that's only if Gittens gives an opportunity by missing. Nice rebound by Gittens after the disappointment yesterday with her long jump and her finish in the pentathlon to come back and jump so well here. So second attempt for Anna Hall. Slight brush, she is over on her second attempt. She needs to get off the penultimate faster. That really was not so quick off her right. And when you companion that with the fact that she's not getting a lot of help from her arms, Ed fix that. I mean, you've got to get off your penultimate step. In this event, if you don't get off the right from our side or off the left from the other side, you're just not going to jump very high. So now a second attempt for Abby O'Donoghue. She has to clear here to get into a tie for second place. And she's over on her second. So up the bar will go to 1 meter 89, the height that the pentathletes made yesterday, both Gittins and Hall clearing that height during the pentathlon competition, 6'2 and a quarter. And just as we expect, the top three jumpers in this conference are the top three jumpers in the country. And they're going to go at it head to head. And where you jump in the order is so key. Now O'Donoghue and Hall have to hope for a Gittins miss for an opportunity to get back in the lead. Quickly over to pole vault. Elizabeth Nix, their third and final attempt at the opening height of 12, nine and a half. That's a bailout on the way out. So she is out as we switch over to the high jump quickly. The women go much more quickly than do the men. This is Tyra Gittens, her first attempt at 6'2 and a quarter, height she made yesterday. A little more pressure on the athlete that jumps first. You want to stay clean. She has no misses through the competition. That's why she's leading. And she doesn't open the door at all. And that was very similar to her 6'2 and a quarter jump yesterday as far as had huge height, but she did nick it a little bit on the way down. Here on top, she shows a little bit of patience. She only wants to stay in that position, in that layout position for just a split second, but she knows she's not in the right spot, so she holds it just a little bit longer, gives her bottom a chance to clear. I mean, when you can get off the ground that high, you can you can make a little bit of a mistake and be out too far. When you're jumping 6'4 in front of 6'2 and a quarter, you got a shot at getting over it without knocking it off on the way down. I would argue that might be the winner right there. I think that you might you be know, right. Yeah. 
She may jump higher, but I think that's the winner right there. I mean, technically, Anna has to get it to get it together with her feet at the end. She's getting no help from her arms. That's not going to change. The thing that she can change is, is to jump correctly with her feet at the end. Okay, that was better. But she's landing on her, closer to landing on her plant these last couple. I think she's just running out of gas. You know, there was more pop there yesterday, obviously. So O'Donohue's got to sense that opening. She can sneak in and have sole possession of second place with a clearance here. She can make that. So, yeah, my money would be on O'Donohue to clear this height overhaul. Just because she's fresher. I was going to ask you, so uh, obviously both Hall and Gittins, because they competed yesterday and, and extended themselves. You think, Dwight, normal day, someone that's just high jumping, you have how many really good attempts in you? You know, it depends on, on how fit you are and how hard you train. Oh, sure. I, I liked I liked five, six, and seven for my best jumps, but I could I could bring it later in the competition. Bar Shim is a is an athlete, the Qatarian world champion, is a guy who can bring on, you know, 11, 12, 13. <laughs> it's amazing to me. But yeah, I think five, six, seven, I usually try to gauge it so that my best jumps were gonna be at, at you know, no misses, no misses, no miss, maybe one miss, then the bars at a height I want to clear that meet at, at number five. Yeah, definitely that definitely a better jump there. But I'm hearing her plant up here, so that's never good. And that's probably as close as we've seen her all day long. It's amazing what a difference a day makes, not just in terms of fatigue, but yesterday 186 was her PR. Now she goes 189, you can see she's, now you expect more immediately. Sure. Boom. But you know, she's a few other events on those legs since then too. Totally. You know, but, you can, but you can see in her face, she's like, okay, I should make this. Right, <laughs> yeah, totally. And then and a, and a young athlete, that's exactly the attitude that you want them to have and, and you push them towards that. Hey, you did this yesterday. <laughs> So a second attempt for O'Donohue to take second place by herself. And the first one was a close one. Oh, oh almost a carbon copy of the first jump. I don't know if I'd want to squeeze her closer to the bar. I mean, she really is a pretty tight parabolic curve. I have no complaints there at all. She's not run, landing anywhere close to the other standard. Not taking all that much bar. She does need to smooth out her transition a little bit. I'd like to see a, a little more of, of a smooth curve from her straight to the curve part of her run. There's a little bit of a cut going on there. Take a break from the competition this session, play the national anthem. So competition will stand down for a moment.
encore performance by pole vaulter Sandy Morris, Olympic silver medalist. Jumped here at the vaulted here at the University of Arkansas. And we step right back into the competition with Anna Hall's third attempt at six two and a quarter. So this would match her lifetime best set yesterday as part of the pentathlon competition. Currently tied for second. So if no one else clears another bar, she'll earn seven more points for the Bulldogs. Yeah, again, I can hear her plant up here. And you shouldn't have that much force going into the ground. And still, she had decent height. So based on the way she jumped yesterday and today, I'd, I'd say she's a 6'3 and change, 6'4 high jumper waiting to happen right now. So now Abby O'Donohue in a great position to take over second place on her own with the clearance here, otherwise she ties for second. This is also a jump that would match her lifetime best. And that was not her best of the three, so it will be a two-way tie for second. Anna Hall and Abby O'Donoghue, and there's your champion, Tyra Gittens. And with the long jump going on and 10 points in her pocket, I would think that she would eschew going any higher, but uh, we'll have to see what the decision is. And we are soon going to be seeing running events beginning at 7 o'clock. The men's mile first on the dock. Women's mile, I should say, on the dock. And we'll be back with that when we return to Fayetteville. Back at the SEC Indoor Championship, we got some competing interests. Tyra Gittens going for a meet record at 6 feet 4 inches. And the women's mile on the track getting ready to go here. So a lot of good stuff happening. We'll make sure we cover it all. Dwight, it's to you. All right, John, we're finally on the track with the women's mile, the collegiate record holder, Jenny Berenger, now Simpson, and the SEC meet record holder, Dominique Scott of South Africa and Arkansas six years ago. And from Alabama, this is Amaris Tenisma, the sophomore, has run 433.22 just a couple weeks ago right here in Fayetteville. And Lauren Gregory of the host Arkansas Razorbacks, and this is the beginning of their quest to dominate this SEC conference meet in preparation for the NCAA championships two weeks from now, right here back in Fayetteville. Lauren Gregory from Fort Collins, Colorado. She got the number four time in the nation, number three in the SEC, Amaris Tenizma. She's the number three ranked runner in the country. Top three finishers in each of these two heats will automatically qualify to tomorrow's final. And then the next four fastest non-automatic qualifying times over the two heats. So it's definitely an advantage to be in the second heat when you see what the runners in the first heat have done. They'll stay in these groups until they're through the second full turn, and then they'll break for the inside. Antonisma and Gregory are the two right up front. In that third position is Isabel Van Camp. You'll see the Arkansas runners Try to stick together if possible. Back onto the infield, Tyra Gittens, second attempt at six feet four. She's already won the competition at six two and a quarter, and she definitely has the hip height to clear this height. She's just pressing because it's two centimeters above her lifetime best. She'll have one more. I was going to just say the same thing, Dwight. She looks like now she's just trying a little too hard. She was doing so well when she was relaxed and just bouncing over the bar. Now she's bearing down and trying to really, really muscle it. Around 69 seconds for the first 400 meters. It's 
Let's look, Gregory and Tanisma. Van Camp right there. So just to conclude things in the high jump, Tyra Gittins, after two attempts at 6'4", has decided to retire. She is the winner. She'll win the two 10 points for Texas A&M and now go over to the long jump runway to take her qualifying leap. So already uh, a good evening for Tyra Gittins with a win in the high jump. Gregory choosing to call the pace here. Tanisma happy to let her do so. Right around 221 after four laps. Modest, easy 440 pace. <laughs> 221 for 800 meters. But it's all about those automatic qualifying positions. Finish in the top three, you don't have to worry about the time. The group of five up front, vying for those first three positions. That's Imogene Barrett from Florida. She's up there in that lead pack, trying to hang on the back end of that. Tori Herman from Kentucky there as well. Barrett, a junior at Florida from Australia. Let's see if they are continuing roughly the same pace. Just about, but pretty even all the way through to Nisma now. Running in the outside of lane one into lane two a little bit, but not willing to take the lead. There she goes, she goes into the lead. Tanisma, Gregory, Barrett, Van Camp, and Herman. Only three can automatically qualify. So coming up to the bell, it is Tanisma of Alabama, Gregory of Arkansas, and Barrett of Florida, with Van Camp and Herman not willing to give it up. Gregory looks like she's in position to strike if she needs to, but she's well protected now. Barrett really going side to side with the shoulders. It's going to be Tanisma, Gregory, and Barrett, your three automatic qualifiers with Van Camp very close on the heels of third. Remember, just four time qualifiers out of these two heats. And they picked it up nicely in the last 400 meters. 4.38.15, the winner for Tanisma and Gregory just two tenths back. Well, that's Imogene Barrett's best run of the season by a second, but you're right, absolutely right, Dwight. Lauren Gregory looked like she was ready just to go to another gear in that last 50 meters if she had to, but nice and crisp. It looked like they were on about 442 pace at the halfway point, and they definitely kicked it in with about a quarter mile to go. So the results are official. Uh, Maris Tanisma, Lauren Gregory, and Imogene Barrett are through automatically. Isabel Van Camp and Tori Herman will have to look to see what the times are out of the second heat and hope that their times are fast enough to get through to tomorrow's final. Like the men, the entries are capped at 24 total for the running events, 12 in each of these two heats of the mile. There is Chrissy Gear of Arkansas, the senior. She was second at this championship a year ago. An Arkansas runner has won this event in the last three years, Nikki Hiltz, Lauren Gregory, and Karina Billion. Chrissy Gear is definitely the favorite. She could make it four in a row. There's Kennedy Thompson.
Arkansas with three opportunities in this race. Gracie Hyde, also of Arkansas, entered in the second heat. Kennedy Thompson ranked number 17th in the country right now. She was part of that distance medley relay that won gold last year. Arkansas chose not to run their A-team on the distance medley relay this year to save some bodies because it's a long three-day event. We'll see a number of these athletes doubling back up tomorrow. You make the final in the, in the mile and run the 3,000 meters later in the day. So once again, the top three finishers automatically qualifying to tomorrow's final. And they'll keep an eye on the pace to see if we get time qualifiers out of this second heat. Kennedy Thompson into the early lead. With Laurel Wynn of Ole Miss there on in second. And Gracie Hyde of Arkansas on third. Gear well back in the pack. Gracie Hyde, a transfer from the University of Central Arkansas. She was only a five-minute miler in high school and only ran 454 at Central Arkansas. Just so much improvement since she transferred here. Looked like about 71 or so for the first 400 meters, so out a little bit slower than heat number one. Look how, look how far back Chrissy Gear is, just staying in contact, trying to stay out of trouble. It'll be interesting to see her make her way up through the pack here. Yeah, she's left herself some work to do to get around these runners in front of her. Last thing you want to do is pass on the curve if you can avoid it, just running extra distance. So she picked off about four runners in that straightaway. Well, we have a friend who would say, you're running a farther distance out there in lane two, but a lot of these runners, you, you know, you, you want to run where you're comfortable. And inside, next to the rail, sometimes isn't so comfortable. Get, get between that lane one and two, run where, run where you feel good. Yeah, it's easy to get in trouble on these indoor tracks, especially if the pace starts to slow down a bit. And they, Athletes start to bunch up. So Gracie Hyde of Arkansas leading her teammate Kennedy Thompson, and they're waiting for their other teammate Chrissy Gear to work through the pack now up to fifth place. 221.5 at the 800, just about exactly the 800 time for heat number one. So gear now into spot number three, and Arkansas is one, two, three. They like nothing better than to have their three athletes be the automatic qualifiers. Now let's see if Gracie Hyde is prepared to push the pace. In the same way Teresa might pick things up in heat one. Well, with Arkansas sitting one, two, three, I'm not sure there's really a reason to. See, Chrissy looks like she knows exactly where she's at. And everybody's getting a, big, a good look at the, at the Jumbotron as they come up the back straight and they're able to see their positioning. And with two laps to go, this is absolutely perfect for Arkansas. Here is just very slowly but surely working her way back up closer to her teammate in second place and creating a larger gap between herself and fourth place. Presley Weems of Auburn is that fourth place runner. Thompson looks like she, it's possible that she could be caught for that third spot. She did a lot of work the first half of the race. Let's 
So it's still Gracie Hyde, and now Thompson has just been passed for that third spot. And this heat didn't go as fast as the last one. So she needs to get on it to make certain she gets in as a time qualifier. It's going to be Hyde, Gear, and Weems of Auburn, and then Thompson of Arkansas. And she may not have run fast enough for a time qualifier. We'll have to wait to see. Well, there's a new, nice move by Presley Weems with about 300 meters to go. She passes Kennedy Thompson there. Top of the straight. Looks like she, you know, if this race goes on any farther, she might be able to pass it too, but there's no reason for her to. Top three automatically through, but Chrissy Gear just shows you that she can run from the front, she can run from the back. That's what makes her one of the best runners in the country. Arkansas looked great. And I'll see who qualified to the final when we return to Fayetteville. Welcome back to the SCC Indoor Track Championships. Look at those advancing to the women's mile. There's eight of them, and then the next two qualifiers after that. Kennedy Thompson does make it in on time, so that makes five Arkansas Razorbacks in the final, and then Perry Bockrath from Kentucky rounds out the field. So uh, the distance crew for Arkansas right away showing its strength coming out. They Short have, one now and over the barriers, Dwight. They have half the finalists in the women's mile as we get ready for the women's 60 meter hurdles. Brian O'Rollins, the Olympic champion from Rio, is the collegiate record holder. And Imani Carruthers of Georgia will be starting out of lane six in this first of two heats in the women's 60 meter hurdles. Only the winner of the heat will automatically qualify to the final, then the five fastest times. I should say there are three heats. Heat winner, then the five fastest times after that. There's Destiny Rocker from South Carolina. She's been a finalist at the NCAA Outdoors 100 meter hurdles a couple of different times. She comes in with a PR of 813, nationally ranked 10th. Monica Ruthers has run 806 this season. Lane one and lane eight are open. They run from right to left here at the Randall Tyson Track Center. So it's Carruthers on the left of your screen, Rocker on the right. Rocker with a good start. They go over the first little together. Monty Carruthers, and it's going to be very tight at the tape. Hard to tell from here between Rocker and Carruthers. They're giving it to Rocker in 818. So she will automatically qualify to tomorrow's final. Well, both athletes react to the gun very well, but they stand up. Not a lot of drive to that first hurdle. Amanda Carruthers ran a nice controlled race. Looked like Rocker just out leaned her there at the end. 818. Not bad coming in with an 813. Personal best. Rocker hit that hurdle, the first and third hurdle, pretty good, but she didn't let it get her off balance too much. She was able to regain her position, regain her running stride. Rocker and Carruthers given identical times, 8.18, but Rocker with the automatic qualifier because she is deemed the winner. Very tough to separate. Left shoulder of Destiny Rocker is what made the difference. You know, it's the torso, not the head. Well, then you just never know what's going to happen in the other heats. You want to be a heat winner and not leave that to chance. I think 8.18 will definitely get in, but if the next two heats just get really froggy somehow, there's a chance you might not. Always dip to the line for the win. So heat two of three now setting their blocks. And once again, it'll be lanes one and eight open. 
Masai Russell of Kentucky, the junior, who's run 810 this year. Two times she's been an All American in the 4x4 four four with Kentucky. 810, personal best. And from Horst. Host Arkansas right next to her in lane four, Daze Freeman, the sophomore from Jamaica. Fourth in 2020, has run 8-12 this season. So Freeman in four, Russell in five. Once again, only the heat winner automatically qualifying through to tomorrow's final. Good start by Massey Russell, but Freeman now takes over. It is Freeman. Dazze Freeman is going to win the heat, followed by Rosalie Cooper of Mississippi State out in late six. Remember, it's only the heat winner that advances. 8-10 for Freeman. So that's a lifetime best for the Arkansas sophomore. She gets a pretty solid start, but she really powers after that second hurdle. She gets her feet down on the ground and continues to really run well between the hurdles. The hurdles are not very high and something we critique all the time, but Freeman just managed to really stay in great running position in between the hurdles. Pulled away from a field easily. Number seven in the country amongst the Collegians with that 810. Rosalie Cooper of Mississippi State with a big lifetime best to 815 for second. That's a time that should almost certainly advance to the final, but she'll have to wait. And Masai Russell at 821. That also should be good enough, but you never know what could happen in this third heat. I remember Monty Carruthers ran 818. We said that will probably get through. Ready for heat number three of three. There's Milan Young of LSU. The senior. Runs both of the short hurdles, the 60 and the 100, but she's also a 400 meter hurdler as well. 814, the personal best this season. She'll be out of lane three. Right next to her in lane two from Florida, the sophomore, Grace Stark, is a scratch. So Grace Stark scratching out of this hurdle race. Only four hurdlers. Lanes one, two, seven, and eight all open. Kayla Robinson from Texas A&M out there in lane five has run 8.16 this season. But no Gray Stark in lane two. That is surprising. She was the runner up at this distance a year ago. She's the world U20 record holder. So Stark on the right, excuse me, Young on the right of your side. Out well with her teammate, Mia Phillips. And on the outside, that is Jayla Hollis of Arkansas making a race out of it. So Young runs 8.08. That's the leading time amongst the three heats. Jayla Hollis gets an 8.15 in second. Well, that's a great Young for, that's a great run for Milan Young. Got a little bit funky trail arm, but man, she makes it work. But an outstanding run out there on the outside. Jayla Hollis, a new lifetime best. 8.15 coming down from 8.31. And with that 808, Milan Young now takes over the number seven time in the country amongst the 
women's collegiate hurdlers. There's the official time. Jayla Hollis at 8.15, certainly through to the final. So back with much more running when we get back to Fayetteville. Women's 60 meter hurdle results now official. Let's see the eight young ladies advancing to the final here. 8.25 is your magic time to get that eighth spot on time. You know, they say you're going to have a chance to, to qualify and win for the championship. You need to get eight to ten athletes through today into the finals. Arkansas has put eight in in the first two events. Dwight. And now we're ready for the women's 400 meters. Kendall Ellis setting that collegiate record three years ago. Sydney McLaughlin in her only year at Kentucky with the meet record. There is Taylor Manson of Florida, the senior. 400 meters is just run as fast as you can because out of the five heats, the top eight times go through to tomorrow's final. So there is no dog in it. There's no getting through because you're the heat winner. You just run. We already have a scratch. Cherokee Young of Texas A&M and Jamaica, the sophomore, has been scratched out of lane six. So only three runners here. Taylor Manson starting out in lane four. Taylor Manson, U.S. Junior champion in 2018 in the 400 meters. She got a PR of 52.31, seasonal best 52.74. So they will stay in their lanes through the fir thir first through first two turns, pardon me, and then cut for the pole. And look at Taylor Manson. She is gone. She's running like a time trial. Twenty-three sixty-nine for the first 200 meters. Nothing but running room in front of her. She looks like she's in a groove on this back straight. Got a lot of nice tempo going. Let's see how she can handle this last 100 meters. Starting to struggle. Stephanie Davis trying to close the gap. And unofficially 52-72. Now 52-73. Well, this is what you need to do to run fast times in this conference is to get out and challenge that first 200 meters. People that laid back and let the race come to them usually get left. Taylor Manson does a wonderful job of setting her second half of the race up. When I was coaching at Arizona State, Coach Kraft would always say, look, you got to be up front to give yourself a chance. <laughs> and it's official, 52.73. The winning time for that first of five heats of the 400 meters. By the way, the SEC has eight of the top 12 times in the country in the women's 400 meters. Not a surprise to anyone, but just a good stat with just two weeks to go to the national championships. Most conference meets taking place this weekend. As we move along to heat number two, there is Paris Peoples, the junior here at Arkansas. Has run 52-45 this year, two weeks ago. That puts her number eight in the country. Also in this race on the outside, there's Megan Moss from Kentucky. 52.99. She's taking her time getting back from her warm up run out. 18 year old sophomore from the Bahamas. Runner-up in 2019 at the Jamaican Junior Championships. And again, in the 400s and 200 heats, you pretty much have to run all out because it's all on time. Mostly on the outside, on the inside, I should say. Then Peoples, then Jordan Smith of Vanderbilt, and Megan Moss of Kentucky. 
They're pretty even there at the 100 meter mark. Also making a good target for Paris Peoples. Moss trying hard from the outside, but Peoples is going to get the inside. 24-23, the first 200. She's got some work to do. Megan Moss is hanging in there. There's some separation now with Peoples starting to lift. Her technique staying together. Now let's see what she's got off the turn. Paris Peoples of Arkansas runs here every single day. And she will win this second heat. 52-27 officially. And, and a lifetime best for Paris Peoples. Well, and there's a lot to be said about running on your home track, being able to practice here each and every day. And the 200-meter track is not very big, so you really get to learn the nuances of what it feels like to run in each one of these lanes. And, you know, we had a chance to talk to Lance Harder and said, you know, how important is this a chance to win another championship? Everybody gets to sleep in their own beds and relax and be in their own environment. And he said, well, actually, we're putting everybody at a hotel, so <laughs> they're not sleeping in their own beds. But it's, uh, it's comforting to know where your locker room is, what kind of warm-up, and the distance between the warm-up track and the and the and the and the competition track so just just the little nuances sometimes can make the biggest difference so heat number three of five it'd be interesting to see if you've got to break 53 to get into the final that's sort of the standard usually here at the sec to leave the digs of florida she'll be starting in the preferred lane five, just a freshman. Five-time Pennsylvania State Champion. Out in lane six, Amber Anning of LSU and Great Britain, just a sophomore. Amber Anning was third last year. 400 meters and the four by four. PR of 52-22. So your two fastest times will be on the outside. Talitha Diggs, 52-34. Number six time in the country. Anning the silver medalist at the 2019 European U-20 Under-20 Championships. It's kind of like the collegiate equivalent for Europe. Tierra Robinson Jones down the in inside lane three of AM's run 52 52. Just got a tough lane draw for this first round. So Anning is providing a good pacer for Talitha Diggs. And Diggs in some position to take that pole. And she gets it uncontested. 24 19 for the first 200 meters for Diggs. But Anning is right there. And here comes Robinson Jones. Talitha Diggs hanging on nicely, now lifting up the home stretch. Now it's about time. She's going to win the heat. Unofficially 51.92. That would be the fastest time run so far by quite a bit. 51.91 corrects two. And a big personal best there. It's just amazing. How many freshmen have we seen from Florida just get out early and take control of these races? Talitha Diggs certainly didn't run like she was a freshman. 52-33 for Amber Anning, 52-93 for Robinson Jones. But nice job, freshman. That's very likely three times that we'll get through to the final. All under 53. T Talitha Diggs winning the heat for the lifetime best, 51-91. Amber Anning, a nice job in second. And Tierra Robinson Jones starting from lane three and working herself into the mix at 
Cheyenne Simpson. Eight four five in the women's four hundred. So now heat number four. We have a scratch out in lane six. Sierra Richardson of a and m It looks like Patrick Henry has decided that there's no chance of him winning a team title, and he's going to keep his people as fresh as he possibly can for the NCAA championships in a couple of weeks. So instead we go to Taya Shelby of Vanderbilt, who will start out of lane four. The juniors run 53-42 this season. Well, so far we've got six times under 53 seconds with two heats remaining. The bubble is 53-37, likely to come down. But maybe not from this heat, unless they run much faster than they've run so far this year. Well, we've seen some big performances already. Just the atmosphere here, the fast track. Even smells like a new track in here, so everybody's just stepped up their game. Tyus Shelby gets the pole position easily. 24.96 for the first 200. Well, she looks good right here. She just needs to lock in that tempo, lock in the movement right there. Don't try to do anything extra and just take it home. Fifty-three zero seven right now. That is under the bubble time. And that's a huge lifetime best for her. Uh, more than a second and a half. Well, she looked fantastic through about 300 meters here. She only really started the fade in the last 50. Just like her technique. Nice aggressive start. I don't think there's anything more rewarding than pushing yourself to the limit, looking up and seeing that personal best. So Taya Shelby with a giant personal best, 53.07, one of the rare Vanderbilt finalists on the track. We have one heat remaining. And if, if two runners from this heat go under 53.07, she'll be out, but she gets to walk away from this meet with a big lifetime best. Rosie F. Young of Arkansas, the 19-year-old sophomore, has run 52.27. She's in that preferred lane five. And she has a teammate in this race, Morgan Burks McGee, the senior, third at this distance two years ago. 52.20 as a personal best. She's only run 52.81 this season. Well, either of those times would get her through to the it final. Certainly would. I said only, but <laughs> they're, they're fantastic times. Fifth and final heat. Burks McGee, a seven-time SEC medalist. Her personal best comes way back from her freshman year, 52-20 down at College Station. Fiong making up the stagger on Amove of South Carolina and Burks McGee right there with her teammate. Fiong gets the pole. 23.92, that's one of the faster 200 meter times in route we've seen so far. 
Effion followed by Brooks McGee and Amovo. Brooks McGee looking to make a move off the turn. Effion holding her off. Can they race themselves both into the final? Yes, they can. Rosie Effion 52-59 and Morgan Brooks McGee 52-69. And those times make it so that all the finalists are under 53 seconds. Well, they partnered up and ran that last 150 together, pushing each other. I'm sure that Rosie could feel Morgan right behind her. Morgan was chasing her that entire time, but you said she got out quick. She paid the price down the stretch, but she had enough to hold on. So there's the results from that fifth and final head, uh, heat. Arkansas teammates Effie Young and McGee both through to tomorrow's final, and we're back with more when we return to Fayetteville. We are back here at the 2021 SEC Indoor Track and Field Championships with a look at the qualifiers for the 400 meters. Dwight, you had it right on the head. Everybody had to be under 53 to make it to the final tomorrow. And because of a couple of scratches by A&M, Arkansas, three more into the finals tomorrow because, you know, they'll need the points. Yeah, points is what they need. <laughs> That's on the track. Let's go out onto the field. Well, it's been uh, a field extravaganza, and much like the men's side of things, the high jumper also wins the long jump. But we will, we're giving away the, uh, we're giving away the result. Here's Aaliyah Wisby, second attempt. This puts her into the lead, 21-8 and a quarter. You see the wrap on the left calf there. It could be just to keep it warm. In the fifth round, Tatiana Marsh, the junior from Georgia. She bounces out to a personal best, 20 feet 10 and three quarters of an inch. And she knows it. But after winning the high jump and taking two attempts at 6-4, only getting into the finals with a sixth place distance, Tyra Gittins gets on the runway for a sixth and final jump, and she just nails it by enough. One centimeter to win the competition with 21, eight and three quarters. So double winner, just like Javon Harrison on the men's side, high jump and long jump. Tyra Gittins quite a day, sixth in the, the pentathlon yesterday, and then two wins today, John. And we have Tyra Gittins with us right now. Tyra, if part of athletics is fighting back from adversity, you look like you had a very bad, terrible, no good day yesterday. <laughs> and you come back today. Just uh, tell me how your day was, because it looked like it was fantastic. Today was all about beating myself, because yesterday I, I let the negative Tyra, the bad Tyra that we don't like to see, I let her overtake. I let her, I let her win yesterday, and today I... I just, I relax, I let go, and I have fun, and everything that I wanted to do was executed, and I, I cannot be happier. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm exhausted, but I am, I am so proud of myself, and I am, I'm very happy. Yeah, the joy is evident. So how did you put Bad Tyra away last night? So, after talking to my family and my sisters, um, my sister, she played uh, college volleyball, and she said anytime a negative thought would come in, she would grab the thought and just throw it away. And all night last night, that's what I was doing. I wouldn't even let it, I wouldn't even let it linger. As soon as I felt some kind of negativity, I just grabbed it and I threw it away. And it worked, because today, it was only positive. It was only positivity and... Negative tire was out of sight. <laughs> so you have two weeks to the next pentathlon. Are we anxious for that? Like, would we want to start tomorrow, or are we going to take the two weeks and, and get calm and then go? Definitely taking the two weeks. Um, I have a lot to work on, um, as we can tell from the last pentathlon. <laughs> but, uh, yes, this two weeks is going to be very well needed, and I'm going to use it to train and just get consistent. And I'm coming for NCAA national record <laughs> we will watch for that that's aim high tyra gittens congratulations on a wonderful bounce back to terrific performances and we'll see you in two weeks back here in fayetteville thank you 
Next on the track, the heats of the women's 60 meters, three of them total, Aliyah Hobbs from 2018, the collegiate record holder, Ramon Rochelle from 2015, the meet record holder for the SEC. And the configuration here for qualifying is the heat winner automatically qualifies in the next five fastest times. This is Joella Lloyd of Tennessee and Antigua, the 18-year-old sophomore, national record holder for Antigua and Barbuda. There's Tiana Wilson. She'll be running out of lane five, comes in with a personal best of 734. Bounce back to Joella, Joella Lloyd just for a second. Dwight, Tennessee has never won an SEC 60-meter title. The last short sprint title they won was in 1994, and that was Deidre Davis, and she won the 55-meter. That's on the women's side. On the women's yeah. side. So lane one always open here. Wilson in five for Arkansas. Lloyd of Tennessee in seven. Heat winner only to automatically advance to tomorrow's final. Good start in the middle of the track. She is leading now. Wilson, it's Tiana Wilson. And then here comes Joella Lloyd, the last half of the race. Well run. Didn't transition well to the up ramp, but seems to be fine. Well, that was Tiana Wilson's race to lose. And about the 45 meter mark, Lloyd just kicked it into another gear, wins it with 723, automatically qualifies to tomorrow's final. All right, Joella Lloyd with the gray bottom, second from the left. It took her a little while to get going, but once she did, she was able to hit good a turnover. <laughs> we talk about that up ramp into the slow down area. You've got to actually be ready for it. 7.23 would take her into the finals. We'll see if Tiana Wilson can hold on with a 7.29. In in lane three, Georgia sophomore, Destiny Jackson. In lane four, Vanderbilt sophomore, Madison Ford. So the official results, Joella Lloyd does win it at 7.23. Tiana Wilson with a very solid 7.29 should qualify through with that time. And she will have to wait for the other two heats to see how she stacks up. And going for an eight-person final. Moving along to heat number two. And in lane five, this is Abby Steiner of Kentucky. The junior was the SEC Indoor 200-meter champion a year ago. Well, and I think people recognize her just a little bit more as a 200-meter runner, and I think she wants to change people's mind and let people know she can run the short sprint as well. She's an outstanding starter. She really is able to drive and accelerate. She's ranked number one in the country in the 200 meters, number six in the 60. On the outside in lane eight, Florida sophomore Samira Killebrew, runner up here at this distance a year ago. Ladies, so Steiner in the center of the track in five. Killebrew on the outside will be on the left of your screen in lane eight. Oh, movement there in lane six that drew out lane seven, so they've got some decisions to make. Gun didn't fire, perhaps. Let's see if we get a yellow card or a red card. Green card. No harm, no foul.
is where an experienced athlete now has to go back through their routine, restart the process all over again. Good start for Steiner, as well as Killebrew on the outside. Steiner in the middle of the track. Killebrew, can she hang on? Steiner wins the heat, followed by Samira Killebrew on the outside in lane eight. Unofficially 7.23 for Steiner, 7.25 for Killebrew. Not the best reaction I've seen Abby Steiner have, but man, she just gets out of the blocks. It is so powerful. And when I look at her, I, I see a Lolo Jones type of an athlete. Great force production, great acceleration. Seven twenty-three, not far off her seasonal best of seven twenty-one. We'll see her later in the program. She automatically qualifies to the 60 final, and we will see her in the 200-meter heats closer to the end of the day. And it's official. Steiner wins it with 7.23, Killebrew 7.25, Simone Mason at 7.39. That, that might be a bridge too far to make the final. So heat three of three. And in lane four, that is Jada Baylark of Arkansas, the senior. 7.22. Best from three years ago. I noticed that she's run 19 races so far in 2021, all in this building. Next to her on her right, Tamara Clark of Alabama, the senior. Two-time SEC indoor champ. She won the 200 in 2019 and the 60 last year. Tamara Clark, 10-time SEC medalist. So Baylark in four, Clark in five. Good start for Clark, not so much for Baylark, but Baylark now in her form. As we get to the line, it looks like Baylark, but from this angle, it's very difficult to be certain. Very close at the finish. It's Baylark in 7.20. That's the fastest time of the day. They give the same time to both of them, which does not surprise me. They're very, very close, both of them getting 7.20. Great reaction for Tamara Clark. She got out, almost had a meter lead there. And Baylark comes storming back 7.20. Personal best for both of them. Lifetime personal best for both of them. See Tamara Clark in the white on the left there as we go to a wide pan, both down the middle. Tempo versus power. It'll be fun to see these two line up against Abby Steiner tomorrow. And 720 is the number four time in the nation this year. Both of them get it, but Baylark was the one with the automatic qualifier. They'll both go through to the final, and we'll be back with more from Fayetteville right after this. Give me eight in the 60 for Saturday night. There they are here at the SEC Indoor Championship. A couple more for Arkansas. Jada Baylark with her best showing so far this season. Want to make a quick clarification. Earlier I had speculated that because of some of the COVID affected people that Pat and Henry had to leave behind for Texas A&M in College Station, that maybe he had backed off some in other events with an eye towards the NCAA. Uh, if for instance, Cherokee Young and Sierra Richardson who did not run in the 400. And Pat 
has reached out to us to tell us uh, that that is not the case. Uh, in a text, he said, I am not saving people for the NCAA. We have an issue with the SEC and COVID testing. So uh, our bad, uh, my bad for speculating that perhaps that he was doing. Uh, it is nice to know that not everybody in his team is affected. We saw Gittens and here in the women's 800 guys. The nice thing is we're going to see a Ting Mo and boy, that'll be a treat. And we are ready for that exact race. The women's 800 next on the track. One of first of three heats. Jasmine Frey still the collegiate record holder. And Nicole Cook of Tennessee, the meet record holder. There is the Ning Mo. And she has been burning it up this indoor season. Just 18-year-old sophomore. 201.07 she has run already. Stud from Trenton, New Jersey. Owns about every high school record under 18, under 20, you can imagine. Just on another level right now. First two finishers automatically qualifying to tomorrow's final. Then the next two fastest times over the three heats. So you really want to be top two in these heats. Mo out there in that group of three that stays in their lanes through the first two turns and then they can drop down to the pole. Well, in this qualifying, she's sure to run just as fast as she absolutely has to. We'll see here also on the four by four relay. Just but, effortless but, running. But I was going to say, if she's going to drop the hammer, she's going to wait till the finals tomorrow. But she was the 2019 USA Junior Athlete of the Year, and she stood up in front of everybody at the Jesse Owens Awards and says, my time is now. And she was saying that to some of the pros that were in the room, and she just has made a huge statement this year. Just under 61 seconds for the first 400 meters. And she probably has an eight meter lead right now, running it wire to wire. Remember, it's the first two that automatically qualify. And now she can look up at the big screen to see what exactly is going on behind her. And Marion Block will get that second qualifying position through to the final. Pardon me. Yes, that's Block of Georgia. And Mo, wire to wire with ease. And wins the heat easily in 205.59. Early on in the race, there was a little uh, bit of contact back in the pack that probably didn't help anybody. This is they're going to the pole position now. Mo easily clear of anybody else, but there you can see a little bit of contact going on that continued through that first turn of the second lap. Well, and nobody went down. Marion, Marion Block there might have gotten flagged for cutting in just a little bit too early, but she did a really good job of hitching her wagon there to a Thing Mo coming through with a 206. So a seasonal best run for her, but a Thing makes it look easy. And she's so dynamic and such fun on social media. She looks like she's just having a ball and running fast. Samoa wins the heat, followed by Block. They will automatically qualify through to tomorrow's final. 2-11, not likely to do so. Heat number two, and Shafiqwa Maloney of St. Vincent and Grenadines on the inside, a senior. She'll be running out of lane number one. Ran well here at the Tyson Invitational, 204.65. She was sixth in last year's meet, a transfer from Southern Illinois. And there's Athene Moe's training partner, Dominique Mustin. Also a freshman, just 18 years old from Phoenix.
There are the lane assignments once again. The first two finishers automatically qualify for tomorrow's final, and then the next two qualifiers will be on time over the three heats. They're looking for an eight-runner final. Maloney takes the lead. Mustin currently running second. And Vissa of Ole Miss and Italy currently third. Zateu Vista, she ran the 400 meter leg on the distance medley relay yesterday, so she's got a little running on her legs. Four for the first lap, so Welsh slower than heat number one. Continu continues to be Maloney, followed by Mustin. It's getting a little bit crowded up there in the front now. Abby Harrelson on the outside for Florida trying to get in position as well. Now it's Mustin, Harrelson, Maloney, and Vissa. And for Kentucky, that is Jenna Schwinghammer. So five athletes in that front group trying for two automatic qualifying spots. Maloney back into the lead for Arkansas. Number two is going to go to Schwinghammer of Kentucky, I believe, on the inside. Correct. Maloney, Schwinghammer are the automatic qualifiers with Vissa just four hundredths back in third. This was a really smart running by Shafiqla Maloney. Quite a few people said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on the bell lap. People start taking off. There's Mustin up front. But Maloney, she just moved to the outside of lane two and said, you know what, I'm not gonna panic. She just turns up the tempo just a little bit, passes everybody on the outside. She's definitely had the fastest time coming in and she showed she's just a stronger athlete. It's gonna be a nice, nice run with her and a thing mo, but nice, patient, smart running by the Razorback. Official Shafiqwa Maloney of Arkansas wins the heat. Jenna Schwinghammer comes from pretty much nowhere and on the inside in the finishing straight to nab the second automatic qualifying position. And Sinta Yahu Vissa of Ole Miss, just 400 of a second back in third, must wait for this third heat to see if that time will be fast enough to get through as a time qualifier. Third and final heat on the track, Quinn Owen of Arkansas. This is Gabriel Wilkinson of Florida. We're looking at Quinn Owen on the inside. Gabriel Wilkinson, a sophomore, ran 205.57 a couple weeks ago right here at the Tyson Invitational. And there is Quinn Owen of Arkansas down on the inside, the junior. Nice personal best for her this year, 206.4. So if you're not finishing in the top two, you've got to be better than 208.38 if you want to qualify through on time. Lorena Rango Batris of LSU and Mexico into the lead. 
Wilkinson in second and Owen third currently. And Brianna Lucas of Kentucky rounds out that front group of four. Mattress threw in just under 63 seconds, so the slowest 400 of the three heats so far. Good position out there by Gabby Wilkinson. A lot of wasted energy out there jockeying around the track trying to run, find room to run. Eight hundred is a tough enough race without spending extra energy. Quinn Owen from Arkansas, she ran a leg on that DMR yesterday as well. We'll see what she's got left in the tank here to finish. Wilkinson followed by Owen, and they have separated themselves from the rest of the runners. Right now, those are your two automatic qualifiers. Batras back into third, but this heat is going slower. It may just be the two automatic qualifiers they get through out of this heat. Wilkinson wins it over Owen. And I don't think anybody is going to run fast enough to knock out the 20838 of Abby Harrelson of Florida. That's correct. No time qualifiers from this third heat. Gabby Wilkinson had complete control of this race. Just kind of hung out there in lane two, let somebody else do the work, and with about 350 to go, just said. I'm going to push it, pull away, and that's exactly what she did. Quinn Owen went with her. Easy qualifiers. Wilkinson and Owen are your qualifiers. They will run the final tomorrow, and we'll be back with the 5,000-meter final when we return to Fayetteville. Finalists for the 800 meters set here at the SEC Indoor Track and Field Championships. And really, all I got to worry about right now is the name at the top. The thing Moo comes in. Number two all time at A&M in this distance. Number five all time in the NCAA already. Um, the collegiate meet record, too flat, certainly will be under assault tomorrow and something to watch for. That's the half. We've got 5,000 meters up next. Dwight, Dan, take your time. You got a long time to talk here. Yes, John, one of the few finals we have on the track today, the 5,000 meters for women. Emily Sisson of Providence with the collegiate record. Katie Izzo of Arkansas with the meet record. <laughs> The maximum amount of entries permitted here at the SEC is 24. We have 22 athletes running in this 5,000 meters. And we'll try to pick out the ones to watch, at least coming into the meet as best we can. We've got Katie Izzo, who is the meet record holder from last year, coming back to try to defend her title, and as well as Mercy Shalangat of Alabama. And Jessica Drop, one of the Drop twins from Georgia. There's Izzo, you can see from Arkansas. Number 11 on the hip. Jessica Drop right in front of her, number four on her hip. usually spot Jessica drop. She has her head sort of bobbing from side to side. Paula Radcliffe style, the marathoner from Great Britain who used to do that rather prominently. And the pace is decent as the pack is nicely strung out except at the back. There's the Mercy Chilangat, Chilangat with the number two on her thigh. Number nine ranked athlete in the. She was a 2020 cross country champion this year. Came over from the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley after a freshman year. And 
Abby Gray of Arkansas leading during the early parts of the race. There are just three Arkansas athletes in this race. That's a little surprising to me. I would have expected that there would have been more. There were six on the men's side. They had literally 25% of the race, and I believe five of the six scored. Outside in the Tennessee uniform, that's Sydney Seymour. While well, you look at her 16.54 for a 5K, not that impressive, but just a couple of weeks ago at the Winter Classic in Tallahassee, she ran a cross country race with some of the best athletes from Stanford and Colorado. Got her qualifier for cross country nationals. So she's had a tremendous cross country season, but just hasn't transferred it into an indoor 5K yet. Abby Gray continuing to lead over Anna Elkin of Ole Miss. And then Sydney Seymour of Tennessee. Jessica Drop remains in fourth from Georgia. And that's Joyce Camelli of Auburn and Kenya, the junior. second in the 3,000 meters two, a year ago. They'll run that race tomorrow. Drop it now making a move to get into third. Her sister is back about seventh. Maybe a little further back, more like 10th. And Katie Izzo has very quietly and unassumingly inserted herself into that lead pack now in fourth place. And has, so has Mercy Schlangott, who spent the first three or four laps back in the back. Kevin Saylor telling me that Taylor Ewart of Arkansas did not start the race, so there were 21 athletes in this final. And Abby Gray has been doing all the work up front. 17 laps remaining. About a third through the race. Gray, Elkin, Drop, Izzo, Shalangat. Melly and Seymour. And that's Victoria Simmons from Ole Miss in the back of that lead pack, just trying to hang on. And that is such a tough spot. Some of these athletes, you don't want to get left by the lead pack. Then you're out in no man's land running all by yourself to see if she can stay connected to that front group. Everybody happy with Abby Gray's pace. Nobody trying to do anything to change things. She's not moving anywhere. So with about 15 laps remaining, we're going to step aside for a couple of minutes and come back and rejoin this for the final few laps. We are back with live racing here, 5,000 meters. The SEC Indoor Track and Field Championship got a lead pack there of six seven runners that have distanced themselves from the field but they got about half the distance to go so that's a good spot for us to take a minute visit the field Dwight Dan Rapovo. all right John in the pole vault Smith from Georgia Kayla Smith from Georgia over at 14-3 and a quarter. 
This is Lisa Gunnarsson, her first attempt at 14, three and a quarter. She'll jump the same height as Smith, only she'll finish in third position because it took her three tries to get over 14, one and a quarter. And here is your winner, Julia Fixen of Georgia, four meters 40, 14, five and a quarter with a nice wrap, but it stays on. So Georgia, a one, two, that's 18 points for the Bulldogs on the women's side in the pole vault. And we just passed 10 laps to go, and it's been a bit of a change since we went away for our break. Jessica Drop now in the lead, followed by Joyce Kennelly of Auburn. Katie Izzo, the defending champion, now into third place. Katie Izzo there in the Arkansas red. Then in, in fourth place, Mercy Shalangat, who's the conference cross country winner. And I, I would tell you, I think that's where the race is right, right now with those two. Um, though Izzo can't, doesn't have eyes in the back of her head, that, that Shellingat marking her uh, just as they were at SEC, very much like we saw in the men's 5,000 where Arkansas had a, had a flood of guys and seemed to be in control, and here came Ole Miss. Uh, that happened in cross country as well. Arkansas team-wise dominated half in front, but then Shellingat came. Uh, came through in the last 400 meters and just really floated through and took the victory along with her teammate. Coach Dan Water says she's in great physical condition, really fit. And then, you know, she's got, uh, she comes from a running family. Her brother Vincent Kiprock, uh, SEC championships, top five finishes in the NCAA as well at the uh, five and 10K distances and, and cross country. So um, I keep an eye on those two right there because I think that's where it's going to come down. It looks to me like they've just dropped Anna Elkin off the back from Ole Miss. So it's a group of four. It's Camelli followed by Drop, Katie Izzo, the defending champion, and then Mercy Chalangat, who is really just stalking them all from that fourth position as they start to lap runners, which becomes an annoyance and a danger. Now seven laps remaining. Abby Gray did a lot of the work and she's paying the price as she fades back into the pack. Still in scoring position, currently in eight for Arkansas. In outdoor track and field racing, when athletes begin to get lapped, they usually move to that second lane, but that's not customary here indoors. Izzo now making a move into second, and Shalangat covers it. That puts Jessica Drop back into fourth. And a little bit of aji baji as they call it, there between <laughs> Drop and Shalangat, and Shalangat says, okay, I'll get out of your way, I'll just go into the lead. Shalangat liked that position right on Izzo's shoulder and Jessica Drop was kind of in the way and she said get out of there that's the position I want. I'm not sure Chalanga really wants to be leading at this point. Five laps remaining. She given her making herself a target for Izzo and Camelli. Now she may just be that full of run or that confident that she can pull away. But Izzo's the defending champion and this is her track. Camelli went out of picture there just for a minute, but she seemed to regather herself. Now she's back up in the race as well. Eight hundred meters remaining. It is Chilangat, Izzo, and Camelli. Each of one of them looks like they've got gas in the tank. So now it's going to come down to lake speed. With three laps remaining, nothing has changed. Still Chilangat, Izzo, and Camelli. Mm -hmm. 
Rizzo winning that 3,000 5,000 double last year at College Station. That's the last meet of 2020 that we covered. And Camelli right behind her was second in that 3,000 last year. Now 400 meters remaining. A small gap develops between Izzo and Camelli. Katie looks good. She doesn't look like she's too gassed, really. Well, she has fewer contacts per lap than does Shalangat. And you know what I always say, it's always better to be the hunter than the hunted. There goes Izzo getting positioned at the bell. Nothing has changed. Chilangat followed by Izzo and then Camelli as they continue to lap runners. Now when Izzo makes the move, can Chilangat cover it? She's got to know that it's coming now. She can see it on the screen and it's the last straightaway before the finish straightaway. And you've got lapped runners. Izzo drops in cleanly. And Camelli going to make a move, too. Jalan got back to third. She might have made her move too early. I was surprised to see her go on the lead. And then here comes Camelli. Second a year ago, wins it here. Izzo ends up second. Jalan got third. An interesting series of events over the last few laps. I'm really surprised that Mercy Jalan got took the lead when she did. Well, I think you called it, Dwight. I don't think you, you said she didn't want to probably take the lead right there. And when she did, it just took a little bit more energy out of her. And she didn't have anything in that last 100 meters. I thought that was brilliant racing by Katie Izzo. This is a nice move. Get her on the straight. And you could almost see the defeat in Chalanga as Katie Izzo went by her. But it was it was Camelli who still had a lot left. She fell out of picture with about five laps to go, and then she managed to regather and come back and just go storming to the finish line in an outstanding 15.46 for the win. Number four time in the country this year for Camelli, and almost a blanket finish in the top three, showing the strength now of the distances in the SEC. That's a new meet record for Joyce Camelli, and we'll be back with the 200 meter heats when we return to Fayetteville. Final results from the women's 5,000 meter that turned out to be a great race between the three ladies there at one, two, three. Two of them come in under the conference record and the battle between Izzo and Chelengat ends up going to Joyce Camelli of Auburn, War Eagle. She's winners talk first on this show. Joyce, congratulations, if you would. Where was it you decided that you had this race won? Thank you so much. I mean, first of all, I want to thank God. This wasn't easy. And coming to conference meet, I mean, this is a competitive conference. And this being my 30th uh, days of practice, I mean, I'm really happy for this day. And I want to congratulate everybody who, who was able to race this race today. It wasn't easy. But for me, because I was ranked number 19 in the country, that was an issue, an issue to me. I just uh, stay focused and believe myself and believing in my instincts like I can do it. So, I mean, this being the 30 days of my practice, I mean, I'm so happy. It's not easy to compete uh, in Southeastern Conference. Um, I mean, I put a lot of input with my coaches and my teammates. I want to thank everybody. Well, it was a terrific performance. Congratulations to you. Thank you so much. It's 5,000 meters. We're going to let you go get a glass of water, uh, relax, stretch out, and get that, that shakeout run in. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So, Dwight, as I throw it back to you for the women's 200-meter heats, I just did the math. Uh, if every one of these gals, uh, we stack their distance end to end, they'll run 4,800 meters. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> and we just had the 5,000-meter winner. All right, John, first of six heats of the 200 meters. Gabby Thomas setting that collegiate record here three years ago. And is, as the 400, you just got to run fast because they only take the eight top times out of these six heats. This is Layla Owens of Texas A&M, the freshman. She will start in that preferred lane five. It's one lap, all in lanes. Run as fast as you can so you can get a final spot tomorrow. 
There's Jajira Miles, a sophomore out of Kentucky. She'll be in lane six. She come, comes in with a 23.46 seasonal best. Layla Owens has a little bit faster time than her, 23.31 in lane five. Freshman in five, sophomore in six. Owens and A&M can key off of Miles of Kentucky for the first half of the race. From the inside, Madison Fuller of Vanderbilt, then Rachel Hall of A&M, Owens of A&M, and then Miles of Kentucky. And Miles is out. The disadvantage is she doesn't see anybody. Run a blind. Make sure Miles is going to win it. Now it's a matter of the time. 23-20 unofficially for DeJour Miles of Kentucky. Corrected to 23-21. Well, when you're in the outside lane and you can't see anybody, sometimes you just run scared. And DeJour Miles just took off on the blast of the gun like somebody was chasing her. And you know what? Three people were, and she runs a personal best. It's reasonable to expect that that time would qualify through, but there are five more heats. Desjure Miles running 23-21. Rachel Hall of A&M running 23-75 from lane four. Heat number two, and this features Favor Ophili of Nigeria. She'll start in lane number four. Just a freshman, has run 23.36. And Samira Killebrew, who we saw in the 60 meters earlier, she draws lane three, which is really tight for this 200. Talking to Coach Shaver yesterday, said Faber Ophelia was one of those young athletes that he really looked to to be an integral part of this program and wanted to see how she was going to respond to this type of pressure. Just a freshman. He's got a lot of young kids on the team, but he also has some veterans that are going to really bolster his team outdoors. He thinks he's a much stronger team in the outdoors, get some people back. They didn't, they, they gave everybody an outdoor season again that didn't compete last year, but they didn't reinstate them an indoor season. So they didn't get to go to a national championship, but they also didn't, didn't get that season back. Killebrew on the inside in three, Ophelia in four, then Nia Benton Andrews of Auburn in five, Faith Gilbert in six. Killebrew's lucky she is short of stature, so that lane three won't bother her as much as a taller athlete. And Faber Ophelia pulling away, a very strong performance from the LSU freshman, 23-15 officially. And Killebrew at 23-57. Favor Ophelia, no relation to the British hurdling sisters from Michigan, but Favor Ophelia just runs a really nice second turn there. Stays to the outside, no chance of her stepping on the lines. She comes away with a personal best. And that 23.15 is the number four time in the country this year. Samira Killebrew, 23.57, also a lifetime best from not a great lane draw. She hopes to improve on that lane in the final. Heat number three of six. And in lane five, Tiana Wilson of Arkansas, just a junior. She's run 23-29 earlier this month. 
four by four medalist last season. And just to her outside in lane six, Jania Martin of Texas A&M, also a junior, has run 23-44 this season. Almost all these good times are run either here or in College Station, and some from Texas Tech. So far, there are six times under 24 seconds out of the first two heats. Six. Jada Eckford on the inside for Ole Miss, Deja Lampkin of Alabama, then Tiana Wilson of Arkansas, and Jania Martin of AM. Very even between Wilson and Martin. And Martin has the higher hill to climb, but the better downhill. But Wilson trains here every day. Deanna Wilson and Martin going to hold her off. Martin holds her off to the line, 23-18. Now 17 for Martin. That's a lifetime best for her. And 23-23 for Wilson is also a lifetime best. That's some fantastic running out there in lane six. Jeannie Martin looks like she almost missed a step, kind of stumbled a little bit before she got to the bottom of that turn, but she was able to readjust herself and finish strong. This track absolutely is fast. Lifetime best after lifetime best here in the 200 meters. Twenty-three for seventeen for Martin. That's the number seven time in the country this year. And Tiana Wilson gets a lifetime best in the heat. Maybe can improve upon that in the final. But the lane distribution is an issue. There's eight finalists, eight lanes, four of them not great. And the bubble time moves down to 23.93. As we look at Jayla Hollis in heat four, she will run out of lane four. Just a freshman. Well, and you see the two Arkansas runners in this race, and this is what makes Arkansas such a tough team to beat, why they're going to be such a hard team to beat at the Nationals as well, is they just aren't strong in the distance races. They have athletes peppered through all these events. Ariana Augustine from LSU. She'll be on the outside, 2361, personal best. She has run seasonal best, excuse me. She has run 2340. That was two seasons ago, right here in this building at the SEC championship meet. That lane six is a really important lane because everybody keys off it. When lane six goes fast, so do the inside lanes. From the inside, Destiny Charles of Auburn, and then it's Jayla Hollis of Arkansas, Kathleen Campbell of Arkansas, and Ariana Augustine of LSU on the outside. Hollis rolling well down in lane four. Hollis comes off the turn first. Hollis and Augustine, and it's going to be Hollis across the line first in 23-38. And that's a lifetime best for. No, I've got the wrong people in the wrong place. 23-30, just off a lifetime best for Hollis. Well, Kathleen Campbell, way back from Arkansas, she ran the DMR yesterday. Looked like that run took a little bit out of her, but Jayla Hollis from Arkansas, nice solid run in the middle of the track. I'm sure, she would have liked to have been on one of those. Outside lanes five or six, right around her personal best. Seasonal best for Ariana Augustine and 23.51. Puts her in sixth place overall with still two heats remaining. In lane six, she is the NCAA leader of 
There is one of the races is under review in this 200. It's very, very hard not to run close to that inside line, especially on those inside lanes. So we saw a lot of DQs in the men's 200 for lane violations earlier today. Heat number five of six, there's Abby Steiner, winner of her 60 meter heat. She will be in that final tomorrow. And she draws lane six here at the Randall Tyson Track Center. She is the defending champion in this event. Simone Mason, tough lane three draw for the LSU Tiger. Third in this event a year ago. Well, Abby Steiner is not only the number one, number one ranked 200 meter runner in the country. She's number ranked number two ranked 200 meter runner in the world right now. And out in lane six, she is running all by herself. Hopes to not see her competitors until after the finish line. Simone Mason inside of that lane three, very, very hard to navigate. Got to work so hard through those turns to fight the centrifugal force. Steiner staying low, just like the sprinter that she is. That's how she won the 60 meters. Now she starts to lift with her arms. It's Joella Lloyd of Tennessee trying to give chase in lane four. Steiner lifting nicely up the home straight. Ooh, what wow. a time, 22.39. Wow. That's been corrected to 22.41. That is a meet record. And just three hundredths of a second off the collegiate record of Gabby Thomas from three years ago. That was a wow. Well, let's take a look at Abby Steiner. She just does such a great job of accelerating. Outstanding 60 meter runner. She stays right in the middle of that lane. I'd love to see her get, give me some elbow on the backside of that run, but she just keeps the pressure on. She continues to just try and accelerate. Nobody does it better in college right now in this 200 meters. It's going to be great to see her outdoors. I, she's running so well. She's going to give herself a chance at the Olympic trials in the 200 meters running this fast. At time, 22.41 makes her the number three collegian all time. Tie for third. And just three hundredths of a second off tying the collegiate record in the heat. And the bubble drops down to 23.51 with one heat remaining. Looks like she'll be the fastest qualifier and she'll get lane five probably tomorrow. So she'll be able to key off the person on the outside, be really comfortable in one of those outside lanes. And she'll have that 60 meter final as a warm up. All right, final heat of six. And then Tamara Clark back from the 60. Now running the 200, two-time SEC indoor champion, once at this distance two years ago, and then last year at the 60-meter distance. And Jada Baylark, who we saw also in the 60, on her inside in lane five. Two seniors. Clark has a 22.69 lifetime best from a year ago at College Station at last year's conference meet. 23.51 is the bubble time, time number eight. <laughs> Jada Boylark has Tamara, Tamara Clark as a target. And Emanuela Aliu of Texas A&M also right there in lane four, but it is Tamara Clark off the turn. Clark is going to win the heat on officially 22.73. That's going to be the number two time run today. And Jada Baylark at 23.09, the number three time run today. And Aliu, who started out in lane four, looks like she may have run herself into the final. Number two time this year amongst collegians, only behind Abby Steiner. Well, great run by Tamara Clark. Just an exhibition in turnover. She has such great turnover. 
Looks like she's almost taken twice as many strides as Jada Baylark. And it just works for her indoors. Outstanding time, 22.73. And it's official, only two runners under 23 seconds in the heats. What will they do in the final? We'll come back to wrap things up right after this. Back to wrap, thing, wrap things up here on the preliminary day of the SEC Women's Men's Indoor Championship. Women's tonight on center stage. There's the 200 meter qualifiers. And of course, Abby Steiner was a big wow, but I've got one for you as well up there in the booth. So Arkansas with the three gals that they, they qualify here, uh, they had 19 chances to get women through to the final tomorrow. 18 of them made it, 18 of 19. So the women's team standing after seven of 17 events. Georgia's right there. Ole Miss, Arkansas a point behind in third, but they, the wave will come from the Razorbacks tomorrow to be sure. To wrap things up, final thoughts on what we saw here today from the guys who called it, Dwight and Dan. I don't want to steal Dan, so I'm going to take Abby Steiner in that 200 meters. I think that was pretty uh, unlooked for. Number three time collegiately tied uh, and only a heat because I don't want to take the, the field event star from you, Dan. <laughs> I was going to say, we got to see good Tyra push bad Tyra aside <laughs> and get the job done. So that was outstanding, winning two field events in inside of an hour. And it was a great comeback from the disappointment she had yesterday as she had the trouble in the long jump. I literally was sitting very, you know, on the front row as she sat there and was talking to bad Tyra. An outstanding day of competition here across the board. The home team didn't disappoint. We'll get tomorrow when we hand out trophies and we hand out conference titles. And in this conference, being an SEC champ, meet something. We'll see you tomorrow for the men at 125 Eastern, the women at 625. For Dwight Stones, Dan O'Brien, I'm John Anderson. Thanks for watching.